Well, hello everybody and welcome. Um, I see you're slowly um, joining the session as these numbers keep um, ticking up. We're at 17 and counting. Welcome, I hope you had a nice lunch break. Um, our uh, one o'clock session, um, starting right now, is the Turing Way uh, session on investing in human infrastructure. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. Kirsty Whitaker and Dr. Mavika Sharan, um, who will be your presenters um, in the session. Kirsty is the program director of the Tools, Practices and Systems program at the Alan Turing Institute. And Malvika is a senior researcher in the same program, looking after open infrastructure. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. We have a shared Google Doc for our note taking and for orientation throughout the session. Um, and you can find the link in the chat on the right side. I will just repost it again, and I think we can pin, uh, pin it as well. Um, so Malvika will explain how to kind of uh, drive the document throughout the session, but they will be, just to sort of emphasize now, there will be some uh, time for uh, silent reflection and for answering, uh, for asking questions, answering questions throughout uh, the session. So please uh, take your cue from Malvika around uh, when to ask your questions. Um, Obviously, if there are procedural or admin questions or you can't hear the presenter, please uh, ask a question in the in the chat or basically let us know in the chat or otherwise. And uh, finally, um, some of you may have used Hopin, some have not. Uh, the way you would uh, you could ask a question, well, primarily through the Google Doc, which I've just shared, or you can interact with us via the chat function on the right. And you can also request to uh, show up on the screen and unmute yourself so we can hear you and see you. And the way you would do that is, um, well, I hope you can see an orange button, which is on the top right side of your screen. If you click on that button, we as moderators should be able to uh, let you inside the room. And then basically it's like you've just joined the Zoom room and then you know behave accordingly as if you're just in a normal Zoom room. Um, and I think there'll be some breakout sessions later. So uh, Malvika will explain those. Um, so uh, again, thank you very much for joining. It should be a fun interactive session. And I'd like to hand over to Malvika. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aida. Uh, so I'm going to actually dig straight into the document so you all know where we are, what we are doing. So the document that we've shared is for you. It's for you to know what we are doing, what this uh, workshop is about, and also come back to this after the session is over. Um, just to give uh, another reminder that there's a code of conduct that applies to this event. Um, the presentation material that we have here have already been uploaded on Zenodo that you can access under CC BY 4.0 license, as well as this document. As I said, it's for you. However, if you're sharing any information from these notes publicly, please redact any personal information and uh, attribute as the Turing Way AI UK 2022. So I'm going to just show you page three. It should be in page two, but uh, this is natural problem to happen. You'll see we have an agenda. We have uh, spaces for note taking. Um, thank you, Batul, for already starting us off. Uh, but you can start by actually testing if this document has the edit access for you. Please write your name. Uh, tell us where you're joining from. What's your Twitter handle if you have any? But especially tell us, what do you hope to get out of this workshop in an ideal scenario? Uh, we're going to give you about a minute just so we know everyone has access to this document. And we also can prepare uh, what else should we cover if we haven't planned that already. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for the moment. I can <clears throat> I can see a few people typing into the Google Doc, so that's really fantastic. Thank you, uh, thank you to everyone who's here. So while that's happening, I'm again going to go back 
share actually uh, some of my slides as you're writing because it would be hopefully helpful um, for you to know who we are, what we are doing and who you can contact. So I'm going to move my notes here every now and then I'll look on my right, but it's my second screen. Um, so as you heard, my name is Malvika Sharan and uh, I am a senior researcher um, at the Allen Turing Institute working with Kirsty. I'm, I'm co-leading the Turing Way with Kirsty as well. Um, but in the call, we also have Anne Lee Steele. She is our community manager and will be helping us moderate chat and document. So if you have any questions, please pop them up in the chat. Um, this event is one of the first stakeholder workshop where we will share about the project and invite you to join this conversation on investing in and strengthening human infrastructure required to lead a culture change with an ambition of changing the world for better. I want to also tell you a bit about the Turing Way. I don't want to assume that you already know. The Turing Way is an open source and community-led project that aims to open up the potential of data science for everyone. Through collaborative development of the Turing Way project, we bring together a diverse community of researchers, educators, funders, leaders, and members in different roles within data science and research at the Allen Turing Institute across the UK and also internationally. We seek to provide all information that researchers need throughout the life cycle of their project to ensure that their research is, is reproducible, ethical, open, and collaborative for everyone. So I want to start by also defining reproducibility because we know we understand reproducibility quite differently. So in this chart, very simply put together, when same analysis is applied to same data set, it should produce the same result. There are also other concepts about replicability when you have same analysis but applied to different data set or data set generated in a different scenario. You can also learn about robustness and generalizability but when we talk about computational reproducibility in data science, this is what we are aiming for as the minimum quality indicator to ensure that our research is reusable by others and reproducible by them. But reproducibility is not a one-off thing. It needs to be considered at all stages of research. It starts right when you have a research idea, you want to communicate that with others. You want to plan and design, collect data, process your data, in that process you actually make decisions around what methods to apply, what analysis approaches to take. Once you're done with this part of the research, you want to publish it so other people can access it. And then it just doesn't stop there, you want to archive it. So this can be reused by you or by someone else within the same field as you or beyond. And reproducibility requires lots of complex decision-making and choices that happens throughout this. A whole life cycle again. So the project started uh, with a guide for reproducibility um, and our contributors started to write best practices, guidance and recommendation in chapters describing various concepts and tools that can ensure the reproducibility aspect of data research. However, data practices were not enough as research also includes the way we communicate our work with others, the way we design our project, and the efficient collaboration that we want to have with each other. All these while ensuring that the, the highest ethical standard and research integrity in our research. In order to accommodate all these requirements in research and data science, we have collectively written a web-based handbook with five guides on reproducible research, project design, communication, collaboration, and ethics. And we also document all our processes and workflow in community handbook to make sure that other people are able to replicate and extend the project beyond the Turing way. And we understand that data science will continue to evolve and change with time, location, and new knowledge that our community members produce. Therefore, the project is and will always be a work in progress. We've seen our project and community grow rapidly over the last three years, and we currently host about 260 live pages. These are chapters within chapters um, and these are co-written by uh, 323 contributors some of the notable impact uh, that have been influential for uh, for the work that we do um, 
include some of these examples. So one is the Turing base mentioned as a reference to inform inclusive and ethical practices in an emerging technology charter by Mayor of London. Our research resources are referenced in the reproducibility of science scientific result in EU report. Uh, we've also been mentioned by Innovation Scholars UKRI grant uh, as an example of culture change we want to see at the national level across research. More than eight known projects have replicated or extended the project, and one of them is uh, hosted within Office for National Statistics as well. It is used as one of the gold standard for educators and have been referenced in highly popular training materials, such as hosted by Code Refinery and Library Carpentries. And finally, we, uh, the project has been cited by over 25 peer reviewed articles and over hundred, uh, hundreds of online resources. And our community also includes thousands of users of the project um, in the way that they engage with us through different platforms. And with that, I'm going to hand it to Kirsty to take us forward from here. Yeah, although are you okay with still sharing your screen, Malvika? Yeah. Thank you so That's much. Right. Yeah. So thank you for, for giving that overview and that introduction. Um, I hope some of the audience members have already heard of the Turing Way. Um, I recognize some of the names in the Google Doc. And so thank you, thank you to our fantastic, fantastic contributors. Some of the things that uh, these next few slides cover is a little bit about our, the title of this workshop, which is Investing in Human Infrastructure. And one thing that I want to kind of just start with is highlighting this point that the word open means so many things to so many different people that it's almost lost its meaning. So in the umbrella there, you've got things like open access publications. Um, you might think about open data. And there's quite a lot of sort of uh, challenges around thinking about open data. You may actually want to sort of nudge towards thinking more about fair data that is as, as open as possible, but as restricted as it needs to be for the ethical use. And fair in this case, if you haven't heard of it before, stands for findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. There's also aspects of community science, um, uh, citizen science is it's sometimes called thinking about making open educational materials. So all of our slides are an open educational material. The Turing Way book in is, is itself an open educational material. We're really keen on if you've built something that could be of use for others, making that available. And then I'll just highlight as well open source software, which is something that we really care an awful lot about at the Alan Turing Institute. And we want to sort of support others in creating free and open source software. But the key aspect here, what ties all of these different definitions of open together is thinking about the purpose. So why do we want to make these, um, these resources open? What does that mean? And I think the key aspect that I want to emphasize is that we really should be aligning behind a purpose of improved equity, diversity and inclusion. So thinking about why do you want to work reproducibly? Why do you want to share your efforts? Why do you want to make transparent decisions? And ideally it is for the purpose of improved equity across our, our global ecosystem. So if you go on to the next slide, Malvika, please. So we've got an illustration here of an imagined collaborative project. Um, and so you might want to think about uh, there's, a, there's a problem in the world uh, and some domain experts and, and maybe members of the public have identified that that's a, that's a challenge and it's something that would be good to work collaboratively on. So the domain experts themselves will hopefully sort of define the challenge. They'll, in if it is appropriate to do so, they should engage with members of the public. Once the members of the public have sort of refined the question and made sure that it's clear that it is in fact useful, then you start to look at, well, what data could be available? What get, what data could make it um, possible to answer the question? And then you want to bring in some data scientists, some statisticians, um, some experts in kind of how to model the question. And what I want to really emphasize with this slide is 
how incredibly important it is to keep that cycle going round and round and round. It is not a sort of a, a linear process. It is, in fact, the entire scientific life cycle, and particularly for a collaborative scientific life cycle, you have to keep bringing these people in all the way through the, pro the, the project. And they have to be involved in designing, reflecting, and communicating, as well as conducting all of that research. And one of the one of the key challenges that that we've experienced at the Turing Institute, and that I sort of suspect that many others have um, experienced as well, is just how difficult it can be to coordinate all of those different stakeholders, all of those different contributors. How to know the right timings? How to sort of balance exactly when they need to be involved? Um, and also thinking about the the language and the expertise that each bring. In the positive limit, is it's a great asset and it's and it delivers much much more important and useful um, results. But we do need people who are thinking about how to make sure that members of the public understand, for example, the statistical models, the metadata, so that they can make informed decisions and contribute meaningfully into the um, into the project design and and. Uh, the way that it's conducted. So if you move on to the next slide, Marvika, one of the things that we are really thinking about within the Turing Way project are career pathways that facilitate that cultural change of a more collaborative environment. So instead of plonking people at the corners of that, um, of that illustration of that cartoon, you might think about people who can facilitate the pathways between them. So data stewards, are fantastic experts who can understand the data, understand the metadata, but also start to communicate the data and any of the, um, the legal or the governance requirements that, are, that surround it. Research software engineers will balance as maybe some of the domain expertise, certainly some of the statistical methods, and also probably some of the elements around uh, automating the use of data so that it is reproducible and can be reused. Uh, as Malvika said at the beginning, we have uh, the Turing Way community manager, Anne Lee Steele, who is here today. Um, community managers, you can think of as sort of connecting up all of the different stakeholders, welcoming them, making sure that they are well, um, that they have access to all of the information that they need and potentially providing some trainings if they don't have access to all of that information or they need a little bit more explanation. And then uh, these research in action workshops have been developed by our team at the Turing Institute of Research Application Managers. And so thank you to Aida for hosting us today. Um, and the, the RAMs, you may think of them as also sort of facilitating that, that life cycle. Uh, you could also think of the RAMs as, as just busting out <laughs> of that constrained four corner um, illustration and really reaching out to the people who are going to be affected, who are going to be um, the either, either be the users of the technology, the trained model, the resources that we create, um, or the people who will be uh, affected by that, and making sure that their views are also incorporated into the design. So we want to make sure that instead of sort of just relaxing, I suppose, and saying, yeah, collaborative research is hard, oh dear. We want to encourage you today to think a little bit about what, what are the missing people, what are the missing skills, and how can we support them uh, potentially through long-term career pathways that allow them to participate and smooth out these collaborative projects. So if you go on to the next slide, this is just a little advert for the tools, practices and systems research program that we're working on at the Turing Institute. And the reason we put this in here is that we have um, we, we have a community handbook as part of the Turing Way. We're very, very keen for all of you, uh, members of your organizations, people that you know in your networks to contribute to the Turing Way, to make sure that it's a useful guide for all of you. Um, but we also want you to reuse it yourself and we want you to sort of take and, and customize the information for your own specific research questions. And the ask, I suppose, is 
if you want to contribute to investing in human infrastructure for the purposes of culture change, for the purposes of improved equality, then some of the institutional backing and thinking about the needs of those people, for example, long-term um, career pathways is a great um, is a great strength. And that's certainly something that we're, we're pushing forwards on at the Alan Turing Institute. Let me scooch on to the next slide, which is finally a moment <laughs> for Malvika and I to stop talking and let you um, go back to the Google Doc, please. And if you look just below the um, the, the icebreaker and, and adding your names, there's a section on reflecting and sharing. And we're really keen to hear from you on how do you currently or how could you in the future use, promote or contribute to the Turing way in your local contexts. And if you're not sure about that, please feel free to use that bullet point as a, as a question. For the purposes of time management, we are probably not going to bring you up to uh, verbalize those um, your points there. We have another discussion section that's coming up in just a little bit. So if we're going to, I'll set a timer maybe for three minutes and just let you have a have a read through and have a little think on, on that question. How do you or how could you use uh, the Turing way? And Malvika and I will reflect back some of your points. Uh, if you can't use the Google Doc, for, if for any reason you're having technical difficulties there, please feel free to use the chat in, in Hopin. You're very welcome to um, just type in your perspectives into the chat and we will uh, we'll copy and paste them across for you. I'm smiling because lots of people said the reuse illustration and it has been never the case where I gave the talk and no one asked me about illustration. They are definitely a really widely reusable resource we have. And I think that's a, there's an important sort of, um, larger point, I suppose, on top of that, that we, so we, we pay uh, artists at Scriberia to create those illustrations, um, but we have always made them openly available. And it's a great example of sort of, we made them for ourselves. We made them uh, because they're an engaging way of getting across potentially complex topics. Um, but every part of the Turing Way project is designed to be reused. It happens that the that the illustrations are very easy to reuse and they're very easy to spot how they're reused. But um, I guess I want to sort of extend that and say, please do reuse our illustrations. We get, Malvika and I get great joy whenever we see them uh, tweeted or included in, in articles and things like that. But if you find that there are that there's text or instructions or other aspects of the guidance that would also be useful, please embrace the, um, the spirit of that open source license and um, give us a little bit of credit when you, when you use the text and, uh, and, and run with it. Make sure that it, you are not wasting time rewriting text that already, that already exists for that purpose. So we have a question and I think, Kirsty, I think we can take that. I'll, I'll pose it to you. So we have Ben who has lots of specialized skills, roles. How does the public sector justify paying for this uh, when we have difficulty paying market rate for digital and tech roles? It's really an incredible question. Yeah, it's a really, really, um, it's a really important question. There's a few different layers to kind of what's coming to mind as a response. The 
possibly the least help, possibly the least helpful answer is um I would say without these roles, without these um, connector positions, so the, the research software engineers, research application managers, community managers, and data stewards, um, we in the public sector, so whether that's a research institute, a university, government agency, nonprofit, anything like that, um, we're actually not delivering on the promise of the research. So I think that one of the biggest, one of my biggest sort of positions is that we have to have these roles otherwise we are only delivering on far too narrow um a, a request so that's that's why i think it's important that we have them now your point about the sort of market rates is really really is is obviously a really good one um there is a risk with taking a role uh for example at the alan turing institute that is a new role um it's not super, super clear kind of where the next um, step in, in a career pathway goes when we have literally just made up the title of, for example, research application management. Um, we don't know where people go after that. I would say the pay is similar to other public sector roles and academic roles that you have to supplement um the way in which you're rewarding people for their time, both in terms of money, which is always good, but if you have a cap on how much money you have, then you can't do an awful lot more with that. Where I push very strongly is around um, job security. So trying to think very carefully about how we can make sure that people have long-term contracts. And that's one of, I think, the greatest successes of research software engineers that they are ideally employed as permanent staff members at a research institute or at a university, and they move between projects, but they're always busy and they're always um, employed. So I think that I think career, I think longevity of the contract is a is a major aspect, um, and then ideally, I suppose helping people to feel that they have agency into the direction of the project, because I think that's something that. While many um, private sector organizations do, I like, you know, they have great jobs and people do excellent research within them and, and have some of that freedom. Um, I think it's something that we are able to, to provide as something that we researchers should sort of in the public sector should always be making sure that you're working on something interesting, something that has value and something that is for a social good and something that is uh, open to your contributions. So I suppose those would be my those would be my sort of initial thoughts. The, the last point, actually, just whilst I'm rambling, is I think if we do not come up with innovation and innovative career pathways for the purposes of improved equity, diversity, and inclusion, then who else do we think will do it? And I think if it's not us, we're ceding that ground. Um, and we're leaving behind a challenge, a big challenge, but one that that we have a responsibility, as most of us are funded by the UK taxpayer, we have a responsibility to take forward. So we have another question, uh, which I have tried to answer, but I'll, I'll uh, spell that out anyway. Is a data project that is too sensitive to share outside an organisation uh, research in this context, relevant in this context, I, I suppose, and I'd say yes, um, and I think this is why the Turing Way doesn't promote itself as an open, open. Uh, let me reframe it. We don't say that we are teaching people how to do open. We teach people how to do reproducibility, and reproducibility does not mean you need to open up everything. Um, so I've linked a chapter to research data management and licensing, um, and our incredible contributors, including Esther Plomp, have been working very hard describing what data management means um, and how do we actually share metadata and not hold data when it's sensitive and how do we apply a fair, fair principle that Kirsty just mentioned. So thanks for all the notes. I'm going to just quickly uh, read out a few, which, which is quite uh, interesting. So a lot of you have said that you are using it. So thank you very much. Some of these are always invisible to us. So it's always great joy for us to know that it's being used. 
Um, but I also see some uh, great example of uh, that first we would like to use these resources to understand the workflow within our work, um, gathering researchers working on similar problems to share methods. I think that is really, really important. Sharing is really, really important, mostly because people don't make that part of their research process. And they always do it at the end and they don't have time. So maybe thinking about how the methods and processes are being recorded throughout the development of project is something. If you have an answer to that, please let me know. I get asked a lot. I don't have a lot of answers to that. Kirsty, anything to add before we move on to the next part? No. All right. So no, we do. Yeah, thanks. Carry on. We have a few more things to tell you, um, just to lead to a, an own, a, a bit more open discussion. So, so while working in the Turing way, we have identified that researchers, when engaging within their project or in large scale project like the Turing way, um, call themselves collaborator, but see collaboration quite differently. As they learn more about the project, they take this predictable journey of moving from being a user to becoming a contributor to becoming a collaborator more meaningfully. So we call collaboration mostly when we talk about meaningful collaboration. But to a lot of our readers or first time users, it would look like that they want to come in and help, which is great because helping is, is about working together towards a simple goal. This is a good way for people to get involved. They don't need to have a whole lot of experience working with us. Um, and when I'm saying us, I'm also trying to make you understand that this is quite normal process in all the projects, even within your research group. The second step is cooperation. When people learn a bit more about the project, they identify what specialized skill that they have that they can contribute to. So they can build a shared goal within the project. Um, this could also include having a shared goal but from individual interest so how can i build for example the chapter that my team needs but this can also become part of the turing way so the rest of the world can access that too and finally the the collaboration as a meaningful collaboration where we all work together through a shared goal uh, we have some interest and we build a sense of agency in the work that we do at this stage, the work becomes more exciting. We can bring more diverse perspective. We can tackle diverse challenges and new roles and goals will emerge through this, this collaboration that happens more dynamically here. Um, so knowing that journey that we see within the Turing Way, I also want to put in perspective that the Turing Way is indeed a book, but it is more than a book. It is a community which is which, which experiences this helping collaboration and communication that we do, we follow open source project framework. So you might have heard open source in the context of software, but open source collaboration framework is something that we can apply across any source, sort of open science project. And the aim is to allow people to come in and work together and help to get, help them to take this journey that I was just talking about. And in doing all of these work, we want to build a culture of collaboration. So there are many ways we engage people. And this is one example that I, that I want to give because I because in the Turing way, we really do care about it. And we've invested quite a lot of time uh, in framing our governance around the recognition that we give to all our contributors. Um, in the Turing way, we involve diverse voices and acknowledge them fairly. We understand that if we do not recognize all contributors, we will end up disproportionately ignoring the hidden labor that a lot of people do in research and academia, and especially those who are new to the tech community. Often those people are members of marginalized group who are historically being excluded from open source and data science spaces. So we use very simply a bot called all contributors bot that is installed in our GitHub, anybody who does any sort of contribution gets acknowledged immediately. But we also have dedicated pages where people can go in and write what they are doing, how is that relevant for their work, and build their own personal profile and take pride in doing what they are doing. And we also go beyond and collaborate with organizations. So we have collaboration with the TU Delft, Netherlands eScience Center, Fair Cookbook, Open Life Science, and a few more uh, organizations 
who have mission aligned values and they want to use the Turing way in their own work rather than reinventing the wheel. And finally, when you cite the book, we ask you to cite it as the Turing way community as the main author. Um, we do not want to give first, second, third authorship or so on, mostly because we want to just acknowledge all the work that is happening rather than the amount, but the quality. So with that, we want to bring you to discussion. Um, and there are two things that we want to have an open discussion about. Looking forward, in which direction should we take the Turing Way? Because the Turing Way, as I said, is always a work in progress and it should go and evolve with the needs of our users and stakeholders. And the second is what investment should our stakeholders make to ensure the long-term sustainability of the Turing Way project and its community? And this question is being posed because you are our stakeholder if you are here listening to us or have in any way used the Turing Way. So uh, this question again is on the document. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and ask you to take, let's say 30 seconds to reflect. And whenever you're ready, please um, either use the chat notes. And I think you can raise your hand and Ida could help us bring you in. Yeah, so just maybe to repeat for anyone who's joined a little bit later, the way you would um, verbally ask a question, uh, you need to come into this um, session. The way that works is that there's an orange button at the top right corner of the screen that says share video and audio. If you click on that button, we should be able to bring you in um, and then it looks like a Zoom room. Then you just click on mute and uh, ask a question. So let me know if that works for you. And also we've got Rachel who's uh, requested so to unmute. Um, Rachel, I'm just going to bring you in. I know you're requested to join a little bit earlier in the session. So your question may or may not be relevant now. Or rather, you may have decided not to ask. So in case it's awkward, it just, you know, it's my, it's my fault. And I apologize for not bringing you in earlier. I think the easiest would be, because I know it's a huge question, if you haven't previously thought about it. So maybe the easiest would be, as a user or anybody who's learned about the Turing Way, where do you think the Turing Way should go next based on your experience um, as a researcher or any sort of stakeholder in uh, data science? There's a there's another way of framing this, um, <clears throat> which is, what does the Turing way not deliver to you right now? So if you want to, um, if if our question is phrased too too broadly, um, you may want to think about where you have wanted to share or follow the guidance within the Turing way, and it hasn't quite been the right fit. Uh, we'd be really, really curious to hear examples of that. Um, and yes, and you can either join the call and participate in the discussion um, verbally. You can you can ask your question and as Aida said, we'll bring you in, or you're very welcome to write it in the in the document. Um, Lindsay, you've asked the question of do we have industrial Turing fellows? Um, we uh, I wonder if you I wonder if you'd be if you'd be open to expanding on that question a little bit and tell us a little bit more about what you were what's behind the question.
just to break the ice. Kirsty, what do you think we are not delivering? Great, 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 great question. Great question that I was asking the audience as well. So I think the Turing way, I think I'll give two answers. One, I think the name is a real is a real millstone at the moment for us, because I think it sounds like the Turing are telling you how to behave. And um, we are there is some guidance. But I think uh, I think that name and that sort of the 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 understanding of the guide as being a, a telling a one a one directional um, set of instructions a unidirectional set of instructions I think that's a big big problem for the project at the moment because as we've said in the slides what we really what we really care about is that culture change and that sort of participating and co-creating um, and feeling of agency in the work. And so I think that's one thing that um, that I think is pretty tough, to be honest, at the moment. And then I think the other one is that I, it relates to this kind of, this feeling that open means so many different things. I think we do a really good job of connecting with people who have already drunk the Kool-Aid. So I think we as a community do a really good job of relating to people who, for whatever reason, have worked with something that was not reproducible, have struggled to um, get access to a data set, which means that they can't build on previous work, um, have read, you know, academic papers or articles and thought, I would love to be able to use that. Where's where's the code? And I think we potentially, you know, reach out very, very well to um, to people who see the ethical problems of how difficult it is to connect up with people. Uh, for example, if they if they have jargon sort of language barriers that make it very hard uh i think when we when people haven't already thought about that challenge coming along to the turing way can feel i think really overwhelming and i think it can feel a little bit like um you have to do everything right before you can start doing any of the individual um aspects and that's something that we've we've always as a community we've always wanted people to see it as modular see it as sort of helping along being able to kind of you know share out uh, resources as as bespoke recommendations for individual people individual researchers members of the public um but i think that is i think the overwhelming element is probably quite a big challenge for us at this current stage of growth So Nadia, would you do you have a question? Nadia, you are on mute, so you may need to just find the little microphone button if you want to unmute. So while that's happening, we actually have a couple of questions. Are there any tool guides for running sessions with an organization new to data science to introduce the Turing Way ideas in a practical way? So all of our talks are available, all of the slides are available, and we really heavily encourage you to use and reuse all of those slides. That's what we do, is we just sort of remix our slides as we go along sometimes putting them in a slightly different order, sometimes they're so slightly tweaking the text for the sort of specific um, audience that we're speaking with, but it, they come from a great battery of slides. And so that's one thing is that um, an, an overview of a presentation, uh, and sorry, an overview presentation can be very, very useful. I think though the most useful sort of, so, to directly answer the question, 
there's lots and lots of slide decks that are available and that we'd be able to that you could that you could use i think a deeper answer to the question is actually what we would love is to better understand the needs of the audience so um in this question i think it says um if an organization new to data science so what are they trying to achieve they're new to data science but they're obviously they've got a purpose in something else what are they trying to achieve because what um malvika and i but also so many of our community members and potentially um Anne, who I think is in her, possibly her third week at the Turing Institute, um, we can link you up with people who are in the same domain space and who have experienced similar sorts of challenges. And I think that lands much better. I think that's a much more relatable way of engaging um, than sort of an expert in my background is in neuroscience so I can go along and talk to a neuroscience audience really well um but it might be a little bit more relatable if if it was um you know historic in England for example you may want to bring in um one of our one of our uh, core developers Emma Caroon who has worked in that space and that's, I think, something that we can we can provide mentorship and, and support over. Back, I had to go pick up my parcel, the general things you do when you work from home. So I ran. Um, so we also have more questions, uh, Kirsty, in the page number six. I'm going to catch my breath <laughs> while you read it. Uh, no worries. I also want to just, uh, I'll, um, I just want to acknowledge Lindsay's answer in the chat. So thank you, Lindsay, very much for uh, for answering that question of, uh, do we only have, do we have industry Turing, Turing fellows? Um, and she says, I only know of academics who are Turing fellows. So sitting in universities, are there any who are based in companies that might have different audiences to tell about the Turing way? The conferences they attend are very different, um, which is absolutely a really, really great point. So, yeah, so sp specifically, Turing Fellows are university um, members. And actually, to the best of my knowledge, Turing Fellows are only members of the 13 partner universities for the Turing Institute. But I can tell you without too much... Um, I can't give you too much detail in it because it's sort of uh, still under discussion, but the goal is absolutely to try and sort of expand that network a little bit more. And we also have partnerships, collaborations, and we have a Turing internship network that we're building up. And that is uh, not quite the same as what you were suggesting, because I think a, a fellow would probably be a slightly more senior position. Um, but the interns, one of the goals of the interns is to the internship network is to allow early career researchers, probably PhD students, to go in and sort of get some of the experience of working in industry, bring some of their expertise from academia. And um, and I hope very much that they will also cross pollinate some of these recommended best practices. Um, so specifically to the answer to the question, I don't think at the moment at the Turing we have Turing fellows who are not part of um, our 13 partner universities. But the the point behind your question is something that we in the Turing way are very, very keen to um, to foster. So where we can where we can find connections, we're, we're really keen to explore those. So this is not an official thing, but there have been some conversation around people wanting to become the Turing Way Fellow based on where they are and the work that they want to do and grants that they want to write. And that's something we're exploring and very interested to hear more about. There's, there's a really, really great question. And I think Kirsty would like this one quite a lot. The Turing Way is a great resource, but sometimes thought of as complete or finished in its current stage. As the Turing Way grows in size, is it struggling to remain open as an accessible while maintaining existing partnership? What I love about that is that you defined open because it's it's got all of its various different definitions of open. Um, on the one hand, no, 
because we started open, so it's not that hard to kind of um, continue to work in an open way. But open as in accessible, um, yes, I think you're right. And I think this relates to what I was saying earlier that I think one of our challenges for this the size of project that we are now and how much material we have, I think um, it, it's overwhelming for people to digest. And so actually, Malvika, can I throw to you to talk about the, the project that you led with the members of the research engineering team at the Turing Institute around how we actually we keep all of the information in the Turing way, still in the GitHub repository, but we serve it to readers in a sort of, uh, in a tighter and more curated manner to try to make it just a little bit more, um, more accessible. Yeah, definitely. I think this question also captures the the different knowledge level or skill level people are coming into the Turing way. So if you do not know sufficiently enough about the data research, you will think, oh, Turing way is all that I need to know. But the reality is Turing way is growing as the data science grows and as the knowledge we are developing is being shared in the project. But it was easy if there was 10 chapter, but now it's 260 pages and it's not really helpful for people to identify where they should go first to start their data science journey, for instance. So one idea is that we have worked with with research engineers at the Turing are to curate different chapters based on the profile of people. So different professional background that they come from, where should they start? What are the top 10 things they should know? And this, should, this will be served um, via a different pathway so when they arrive in the book they should be able to see different profile they can click on profile they can go and see these 10 pages and not worry about other 250 page that they can look uh, at later time and i think one thing that we definitely added like last year which is warning do not read it cover to cover you just simply cannot do it and you shouldn't try to do it so I think uh, one of the question relates to industry partner is that can we curate 10 most important chapters that the industry partner should learn about when they're working with academia or research or data science or to enable research in their own organization. And that wouldn't require them to read about uh, other things that are more relevant for students or uh, postdocs, for example. And we are also right now working on developing another project for Google Summer of Code so that someone else can take the package, Python package that we have developed and apply it. And to simply put it, if you arrive in the book, you see that there are five guides. Amazing. But when you start exploring, it just is too much. And we want to simplify that. So you, UX experience is very welcome in the Turing way, which I do not have. And I would really love to hear how you can access it in a more uh, easy way. So I think every time someone says, are you doing it? And my answer is like, oh, can you do it for us? Because, you know, that's really important because it's it's a project that we want people to use and we do not know what their user experience is. And therefore, if they can bring in that aspect into the project, that would be hugely, hugely important. Um, Malvika, we've just got seven minutes at the end here, and I think we've got two questions. So we've got Rachel and we've got Suzanne. Um, so Rachel, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Sue, I've, I've brought you in. I just want to give Rachel one more second, but I, I wonder if, Rachel, you're having difficulty with unmuting. It might be easier to type your question in the chat or in the Google Doc, and we'll, we'll have a look at that. Let's do, let's do that. Um, Sue, would you like to ask your question? Oh, you're on, you're still on mute. Do you have a way of unmuting? Um, no, I think we can't hear you. Um, is your question in the chat? Yeah, unfortunately, right. I think um, 
let me let me answer this. So it says, please help Google develop with the guides um, who use it to make it more interactive for us to edit. So we have there's a there's a sort of longer answer to this, which is around um, investing in open infrastructure where that is not sort of feeding into large monopolies, large tech monopolies, including, for example, Google. So um, while we would absolutely welcome Google to come along and contribute to the Turing way as, as open source collaborators, um, it, it's sort of, it would probably be outside of our strategic direction to specifically target individual large tech companies. I think we'd be more, more keen to sort of find um, teams that wanted to participate and maybe use their open source development time to contribute to the Turing Way project. Um, and the making the guide more interactive to edit is a really interesting challenge um, for two reasons. One is that uh, the way that we would make the Turing Way uh, more accessible and, and easier to edit is that we would actually contribute upstream to the Jupyter Book project. So Jupyter is a large open source um, project and they make Jupyter books that turn interactive notebooks into websites, which is what the Turing way is. And so the we would not, one of the things that we're trying very hard to do is not fix a problem specifically for the Turing way, but actually fix it for Jupyter book more broadly so that lots of other downstream projects would be able to benefit. And one of the challenges with interactivity is that we also want to encourage people to learn the processes associated with a Git workflow for um, the purposes of version control. So I was talking earlier about kind of working very hard around thinking about improving equity and inclusion. There is a middle step in there, which is around uh, thinking about robustness, reliability, transparency, auditability of data science research and reproducibility, including the version control. And so that's snapshotting the data, snapshotting the code, snapshotting the outcome um, is a really, really important part of that practice. And for anyone who's here, who's heard of the reproducibility crisis, for example, the lack of version control is one of the sort of the greatest, strongest foundations for why uh, there is such a problem in um, the, the reuse uh, or, or auditing of current research um, or development. And so make the, the question is harder to answer and figure out a pathway forwards on than it may first seem because in making the book more interactive, we actually also make it harder to version control. And it is probably the version control behavior that we are most, most keen to make sure that researchers learn because that's the behavior that we really need for them to take back to their individual projects. Um, but making it more accessible to contribute to and thinking about how we can um, improve the documentation, that is absolutely something that we, we, can, um, we can continue to improve on exactly as Malvika was saying. So, but we, we do have one thing there. There is a hypothesis for annotation. So if you arrive in the book, there is a way that you can highlight things, leave comment without having to go into the GitHub. Um, that's, that, that's just for me and Anne to go back to and make sure that we document that more prominently. So people who do not use GitHub can still contribute uh, by sharing comment. We have one question, and Kirsty, we have one slide as well, just to you know pitch what we want to do. But you have, I, I see that you've already uh, replied to that. No, how does Turing Institute and Turing Way collaborate uh, to develop AI skills? Uh, what relation yeah. between Turing and Turing Way exist? Yeah, so I've I answered that in the chat. So um, the Turing Way is funded by by AI for Science and Government, which is a strategic priority fund. Um, a 38.1 million pound fund that was um, that is administered by the Turing Institute, and this is one of the projects in there. So we have uh, some core team members who are paid out of that grant um, and supported by the Turing Institute. 
I, as Malvika said at the beginning, I lead the tools, practices and systems program at the Turing Institute. So we have the, pro the Turing Way project, we have the program, and then we have the broader goals of the Institute and um, really the Turing Way and this culture change and this focus on open infrastructure uh, and improved collaboration is really right at the center of, of every part of those different levels of uh, the project and the Institute itself. Can you please finish this off for us, Kirsty? Yeah, I can, I can. So we hope you enjoy the next session that you jump over to. I want to thank very, very much the fantastic RAM team for putting on um, such a great, such a great event today. The Turing um, events team and the program committee more broadly for putting on AI UK. It's a huge amount of work and it's a huge collaborative effort and so we would love to hear from you if you are using the Turing way, if you're trying to work in a more collaborative and, and uh, interactive manner. Um, and I would love to invite you to at 5 p.m. on Friday, a fireside chat. We have uh, five different uh, panelists who will be discussing emergent roles in research infrastructure and technology and that's building on this point about um, improving the career pathways for uh, for people who are working to make research more more collaborative um, so please come along and join us and thank you very much to everyone and uh, the Marvika has just put the link in the chat in the session chat it's also in the google document for you to come along and and join us thanks folks Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of AI UK and see you all around. Thanks. All right, Rachel and Sue, I'm going to remove you from the stage and then uh, you can go to the next, go to the next session. Super. Okay, I think folks have dropped off and I think we might be not live anymore, but I'm going to leave and connect you on Slack. Okay, if you are still here, enjoy the rest of AI UK and thank you so much, Malvika. See you soon. See you.